Nobody knew. We didn't know. We didn't know how it was. We didn't know how to cope with it. He certainly didn't know how to cope with it. Apparently, I, it seems to have been a, a family kind of thing. I mean, I understand there was some sort of a family history with alcoholism. Um, and that, as we know now, is a, a, large, a large contributor to that, to that sort of behavior. Uh, it does tend to run in families. The addictive personality, if not necessarily alcoholism, but addictiveness you know, in and of itself. So, you know, he had LSD going on in the beginning. He had all kinds of other drugs going on. He had the alcohol. You know, and plus the fame, too, was sort of a drug. Even though he said he really didn't care for it, it still affected him on a lot of levels. I mean, he used to say that it was just, it gave him access to people he wouldn't ordinarily have access to. It gave him a platform that he would not have had otherwise, and this was very important to him. As far as the other stuff goes, I never saw him once be rude to a fan. I have heard stories, stories where he would actually, he, his pupils were so dilated on LSD that he would actually put pins into his, his pupil. I, I find this very hard to believe in front of fans who freaked out, understandably. I never saw him be rude to a fan. I, I never saw him refuse to sign an autograph or to say hi or, or, or to behave in a civilized fashion to anybody. Um, that said, I didn't see him drunk a whole lot of the time because whenever he was with me, he knew that I wasn't going to put up with that kind of crap from him. So he didn't. I think to a great extent, what you expected from Jim Morrison was what you got from Jim Morrison, except in occasions where he was just hurting too much or it was the only way for him to cope, so he dove into the bottle. Uh, but by and large, no, I always just saw a civilized, romantic, courteous individual, um, and, and that still is the way I prefer to think of him. What he had resolved in his head was that A, nobody was going to see how upset he was, and B, he was going to try to do it as much as possible on his own terms. If you read his testimony from the trial when he, he was allowed to take the stand himself, I believe against his lawyer's wishes. I don't think the lawyer wanted him to, uh, but he wanted to because he just felt this is the only chance I'm going to have to be able to make a statement. So I want to get out there and I want to explain myself. He seemed to feel that this would be the only chance he was going to get to be able to explain to people, even though he knew they weren't going to understand a word of what he was saying. Um, why he had done what he allegedly had done or had not done, as, as he always maintained. Um, and also just to explain various other things about himself, about the counterculture, about what he was doing as an artist, about his background, about all these things. Um, he knew it wasn't going to avail him in the slightest, but he did want to get it there and get it on record that this is how he felt about it and that people should know about it. And, and the jury should certainly take that into consideration. Um, if you read the testimony, you will see that he was so brave. He was so incredibly brave and so funny. And he stuck it to the judge and the jury every chance he got. Just little digs here and there which went miles over their head. And he just felt that this was, you know, the way he had to cope with it. I wasn't down there for his actual testimony, unfortunately. I was only there for the second week of the, of the trial where various witnesses were brought up against him, um, all of whom were somehow connected with the Dade County Prosecutor's Office, all very impartial witnesses, I have no doubt. But yeah, um, and, and much mock was made of them, um, you know, at, at the defense table. But it was just, I, I knew he was doomed, he knew he was doomed, and that was pretty much the way it played out. I was on that program, actually. I was one of the four critics. They didn't let me get a chance to say very much. Between Goldstein and Al Aronowitz and Roscoe, a DJ, they pretty much, you know, they're not going to let the chick really talk. So that was kind of annoying. But I, I liked the beard. I mean, I was one of the few people who did, I think, uh, really go in for it. Everybody else was moaning, oh my god, he cut off half his face. You know, why, why is he doing this? It's just so weird and stupid and, you know, we don't understand it and we don't like it. I thought it was great. I thought it was really, really beginning to point out, you know, the fact that he did want to cut off half his face and distance himself from the image, you know, and this was just another mask for him. Well, obviously, I, I took it very seriously. I believe that he took it very seriously. Um, 
I don't think that it was anything like what Oliver said it was in the movie, that, oh, it was just, you know, a cool idea. I was stoned at the time. He wasn't stoned at the time. He thought it was a great idea, and we talked about it for a couple of months prior to it actually happening. Um, if he hadn't been serious about it, he wouldn't have done it. I mean, especially not since it involved, you know, a tiny little little cut being made, you know. So, ooh, pain, ooh, blood, you know. <laughs> um, but that's like, people sensationalize that. I mean, basically, what I practice, Celtic paganism, is, is what everybody in the British Isles used to practice back before St. Patrick and all the other missionaries came over and mucked everything up beyond repair. Um, we all practiced it. It was a kind of shamanism, a kind of tribal religion, very similar to what Native Americans practice. Uh, we all used to do it back in the old days. Um, everybody who lived east of the Atlantic Ocean and west of the Ural Mountains, this is what everybody did. You know, there were little differences here and there. You know, Mediterranean stuff was different from Celtic stuff, was different from Teutonic stuff, was different from Nordic stuff. But it was basically the same sort of thing. Um, and he was really interested in it, you know, in, in, in much more than just an academic kind of way, uh, which I think is, you know, one of the things that appealed to him about me was that I was, I, I could connect him up with this kind of thing. He has, uh, he was Scottish, Scottish-American by, by, by descent, so obviously he was a Celt as well. Uh, so this appealed to him on, on that level. Um, I mean, I've got poems and stuff that I brought with me I can show you later. I mean, you know, even this, I mean, on the back of it, it says, for my wife, my Patricia, I love you, Jim. So, you know, I don't think you're going to give somebody something like this and have it engraved like that if it's not something you really, really take seriously. Uh, I've got poems and letters addressed to me as Mrs. Morrison. So, you know, whatever people want to say about it, fine. If you don't want to buy into it, that, that's your problem and your limitation. I mean, I know, he knows. That's really all that matters. I did a review of the Beatles' White Album in Jazz and Pop, which uh, he was reading when, when I interviewed him for the first time. And I, I said something like, the Beatles have kind of become sui generis by this point. They're, they're kind of like, like children or dragons. They, they, they really are appreciated only as what they are, you know, because of this album. He did not buy that in the slides. We had a big fight about that. Um, he just he admitted that they had been innovators back in the day, but he had thought they had gotten really, really self-indulgent, which is quite ironic considering the kind of insults that were hurled at him later for the Doors being incredibly self-indulgent. So there was a little bit of pot, meat, kettle, you're both black. You know, there was a little bit of that as well. Um, he did listen to a lot of stuff, even though he claimed he didn't. When he was at my house one night, we were I was playing... Um, John Wesley Harding, and he sang along to pretty much all the songs on it, so, which was really, I wish I had a tape recorder at the time, because, you know, Jim Morrison singing along to All Along the Watchtower and Down Along the Cove would have been really, really interesting. Um, so he did obviously know what people were doing to the extent that, you know, he could sing along with it. Um, on the other hand, he didn't really care for bands much like The Airplane or The Dead, even though he liked them as people, or so he said. Uh, the Airplane and The Doors toured in, uh, in England. In England, actually, they did that big English tour in 68, I guess it was, uh, and went over to Stockholm and Amsterdam and Germany and a couple of other places. He said that um, The Airplane were just all six people out front all the time, doing everything they could, as hard as they could. There was no delicate interplay as my band has, was the way he put it. I said, well, okay, that's a fair enough criticism, but I don't think it's entirely accurate, you know, because the, the airplane were my other favorite group. I adored them. They, the doors in the airplane were just the two top ones for me, and sometimes they even liked the airplane more than I liked the doors, though I never told him that. But usually it was the other way around. They, they were both incredible and, and so different, both doing completely different things. The Dead I never got into, and neither did he. He just thought they were, again, incredibly self-indulgent. I mean, just not disciplined. I said, no, 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 you don't get it. I mean, they're, I'm not a, a cheerleader for the Grateful Dead by any means, but what they were doing was so musical and so differently musical that I think maybe he just kind of missed the point of that. I feel, and I told him this to his face, that as a poet, he was a great songwriter. 
Uh, I just did, did not think that the poetry measured up. And once I started seeing more of the poetry, when, when his private books came out, you know, and he gave you know, copies to me, and I thought, read them, and I thought, oh, you know, whatever. If I have to work harder reading it and interpreting it than the creator did writing it, then I think that's very, very wrong. It doesn't have to be obvious, but it all has to be there. It's like the iceberg. You have to have the nine-tenths that are underwater in order to give meaning to the one-tenth that's above the water that when you ram your freighter into it, it's going to you know, take you down to the bottom of the ocean. I really did not think he was that great shakes as a poet. As a songwriter, I thought he was brilliant. And I really hoped that when he got into the poetry that it would be as brilliant as the songs because he wasn't tied to the requirements of a melody line. He could just spread out. Unfortunately, I think he spread out too much. I did a review of the poetry books in jazz and pop, and when he read it, he sent me a telegram at 3 in the morning saying, thanks for the pat on the back. <laughs> and I thought, OK, I got my point across, obviously. But he went around telling everybody that that was the first time that anyone had ever reviewed his work and not him, which made me very proud because we were in a relationship by that time. And I was very concerned that I would be perceived to be too lenient on him, perhaps. And maybe I was too hard the other way, which is just as unfair and just as biased. But I felt I had to be honest with him, especially about the poetry, because I knew how much it meant to him. They are filming something in the street in front of our house. I'm sorry, no. That's something you scribble in the margins of your notebook during film class, for God's sake. It's not something you put into a book and expect people to take it seriously. But on the other hand, you get something like the soft parade with Tropic Corridor, Tropic Treasure, what got us this far to this mild equator. You're knocked out by that. It's a punch because the music is the arm strength behind the fist. And I just wish the poetry could have had, could have had more. And maybe it would have as he, as he grew older, as he got more into it. it. It probably would have done, but you know, he just ran out of time, unfortunately, or had it taken away from him.